I think just like with the harmonic oscillator argument in n equals eight, I think the supersymmetric one could be the baseline and then you could start looking at more complicated things. But this is supposed to be a two point function. It's a two point function on this R6 times K3 space. In, in homework problem 3.1, I would like you to compute a three point function at one loop in an orbifold. And this kind of sum is analogous to the sum we had before where we had four of these. Because again, you should think of two being hidden in this partition function. So in fact, this is equal to one. So the first non-trivial case is the three-point function. We have one more of these Green's functions. They come from the size high contractions with an additional vertex. So you have this point, this point, and that point. So you have one, two, three marked points. Now, the analogous thing that replaces one is something that in the notes and in the papers I linked on the web page, we call Fn of xi and tau. And the Fn is an infinite sequence of objects that appear. And here only F1 appears. And these are actually produced by a generating function. These are just the things you get from taking the orbifold Green's function evaluated at gamma and then expanding in gamma. So you do like sum gamma n, there's some, maybe some number now, but this is the coefficient in a formal expansion in gamma to generate these objects. And in a lot of these papers, this is called capital omega. So this addresses the comment from before that one way to try to resum things is precisely if you can write a generating function. This object, when expanded in gamma, generates functions that appear in higher endpoint functions. So then if you can, instead of plugging in these objects, you can compute with this object directly, that might buy you something. If you take the plus plus spin structure here, which corresponds to new equals one, so you notice in these papers that talk about the generating function, they don't relate it to this object. So this is something I did here, but it's not usually done in the literature. OK, so that was, I'm well, not going to talk too much about it. I just want to give you some basic outline, and then you can finish this yourself. So my last example was to make another replacement. If you replace two of these coordinates by a torus, that just means put periodic boundary conditions in two of these directions. And that brings you down to, to our world, if you want. There's not much difference in the computation of the spin structure sums of the sums of a new that I talked about, but there's a new complication that actually in some sense makes it simpler, which I will argue now. This two torus now allows world sheet classical solutions, which we usually refer to as instantons. We had this equation of motion on the world sheet, if you remember. The Laplace equation on the world sheet has a pretty trivial solution because this is a second order differential operator. You have a linear solution. And if we make these complex combinations that we talked about before, x4 plus some constant u times x5, then if z1 is linear in the world sheet coordinate z, remember this, this is the embedding from z to target space. If this is linear in z, in non compass space, this could never be meaningful because the value of the embedding map would grow as you go around the world sheet and you will never get back to the same point. But now with the space time torus, now we can have that z is identified with z plus one or z is identified with z plus u, where u is the complex structure of my space time torus. So that means that it is possible to allow this kind of dependence. The action is dz dz bar. Then you just get the derivative of the world sheet momentum I talked about before. And there's some normalization factor where M and N tell you how many times the world sheet wraps around these cycles in space time. And because the action dz dz bar appears as the weighting e to the minus s when we compute our statistical averages, we then obtain sum over these topological sectors e to the minus this action. And then you get the area of the world sheet torus, which is just given by imaginary part of tau. So this is from the integration over z in the world sheet action. And this is called a siegel narine theta function. And this is very nice and simpler than these non-homomorphic Eisenstein series I talked about before, in the sense that this is exponentially suppressed in tau 2. So this has very nice properties from that perspective. This is some double sum. In fact, if you integrate over tau 2, you get nice Eisenstein series from this. But it's nicer in the sense that this double sum converges exponentially for fixed values of the parameters. All right, so that was very brief 
discussion of when you put this T2, the additional thing you get is you have to multiply inside your amplitude with this type of object. And the more complicated solutions you put here, the more this gets generalized. So I will call this capital theta two to signify that there are these two indices being summed over. In more complicated cases, you would have more things to sum over. And this brings me to my final point, which is that we're not done computing amplitudes just because we perform integrals over Z. We also have to do the integral over tau. The remaining work is to integrate over the world sheet parameter. Example three, in some sense, is the easiest. Of course, easy is completely subjective, but it's easiest in the sense that exponentially suppressed things are kind of nice to work with. So I talked a lot more about this in the course notes. In particular, I put an appendix where I explicitly compute the integral of tau two to some parameter s times this theta thing that I just wrote over tau two from zero to infinity. If you do that, you get two times the Riemann zeta function times this whole morphic Eisenstein series we've been talking about of u, where I remind you that u was the space-time complex structure. Remember that we can have torus on the world sheet, but x is a map into space-time. And if we had this f4 times t2 times k3, then this is another torus. And this torus now has complex structure u, and this torus has complex structure little tau. This is the very simplest and pretty trivial example from this point of view of a theta lift. Homework problem 3.2, where lift means you lift this object to an object on you. No, I would say that's included. And in fact, that's the ill-behaved part of this. Goal of this course notes in the appendix is to give an explicit analytic continuation. And that word is bandied about way too much in physics. We often say things like analytic continuation is unique, but it's only unique under very restrictive assumptions. It's completely non-unique if you don't specify how are you going to do it. And the way to do it, in my opinion, is how Riemann did it in his only paper on analytic number theory called On the Prime Numbers Under a Given Number, where he tells you that you can compute this by splitting it up into 0, 1, and 1 infinity. And you do a modular transformation in one of the two pieces. And then the whole thing, you can then put any complex value s. Here's how I would define having a successful analytic continuation. If you can give me the value of this integral for any complex number s, then I think you have succeeded. But if this is defined as a double sum, this does not converge for s equals to one or smaller. So it's not satisfactory to just have this. Once we do this analytic continuation, then this actually defines this for all s. So then you sort of turn around and say, this actually gives a generalization of the es that we define through double sum. Basically from Riemann, we get a way to define it for all complex s. If you just take this literally, it diverges when you put s equals to 1. It has a pole. But then what you do is, which I do explicitly in the appendix, you write out the terms that give that pole, which are these extra terms. And only when you subtract them do you get this thing. But that's if you write it equal to, that means you have assumed that you can perform this integral. So I would say this is star. This star means greater than 1, you can perform it. But if s is not greater than 1, you need to give this integral representation here that is valid for all complex s. Not this integral, but the one that we have done in Riemann's prescription, which I gave explicitly in my course notes. And, th and those follow from the integral representation. So it's not an additional input. You prove the reflection formula from that. So I will talk about that extensively on Friday. But the basic point, I can state in a few minutes, we're trying to compute these tau integrals. The simplest example that I can think of where you see both why this is challenging and what you need to maybe do to succeed is to just compute the area of the fundamental domain. So to me, this is a good exercise that everybody should do. So this is my tau plane. It's the upper half plane. And here's my fundamental domain. And I can now define it more precisely than I did before. It goes from minus 1 half to plus 1 half. And it's bounded here by a circle that is radius one. So this circle is tau one squared plus tau two squared equals one. So the challenge is to compute the area of the fundamental domain, which is this region. You might merely say, well, that area looks like it might be infinite. So why is it not infinite? So if I call this curly F, I literally want to compute the real two-dimensional integral this. The reason it's not infinite is that there's a non-trivial metric. So area only makes sense in some metric. 
And this is the Poincaré matrix. So ds squared is one over tau two squared, d tau one squared plus d tau two squared. This area will be finite. So it's because distances change if you go up and down here. And that is why this is a geodesic in the Poincaré upper half plane with the Poincaré metric. Of course, in a flat space, the circle is not a geodesic between these two points. I think everybody can actually do this computation. What do you have to put for this lower limit now? To compute this area, what do you should you put here? To solve for this curve, so you get square root one minus tau one squared. That's solving tau two from this equation. Zagia tells you, generically, cut off at some capital L. So it turns out to not be important here. As I said, the area is finite. But for illustration, we're going to cut it off at some L. And now this is an elementary integral. I think everybody should do it. Check. It's about one step. And you get pi over 3 minus 1 over L. And of course, this goes to 0 as L goes to infinity. So indeed, the area is pi over 3. And it's important to do this check because it tells you why does pi show up here. And pi, mathematicians call pi a period. And it appears in this context, well, basically because of the circle is somehow built into this calculation. But more generally, we can compute this pi over 3 by this RSZ method, which is kind of like using a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito. But I find it a useful exercise, and I was going to discuss that probably in my lecture on Friday. But this is the baseline. Now you should imagine that we want to compute, put some function here. So here we didn't put any function. We just integrated the volume element, or the area element, I should say. And now we want to integrate our string amplitude that has already been integrated over punctures on the world sheet over tau. The challenge, we said that this modular graph function was e to tau. If you looked at my file lecture 1.nb, the Fourier expansion of the non-homorphic Eisenstein series in tau 1 shows you that, in fact, it does not behave nicely as tau 2 goes to infinity. So it has some factor here and has some factor here. And then it has this nice e to the 2 pi i n tau 1. For example, for s equals 1, it grows linearly. So you work on a cutoff fundamental region. You subtract these divergences. And then the thing that's left is your rankin silberg zauge transform. And one chance would be to do that for e2. If you look carefully, in these papers, what they do then is, as I said before, you put this S. So S is a little bit like dimensional regularization because we take S off of something and then we take it back to something. So it's a little bit like when we do D four minus two epsilon. Whereas this is a cutoff regularization. So you might question as a quantum field theorist, why should we do both? We usually do one of them in quantum field theory. And actually I think this can be improved if you are looking for an invariant cutoff, as some people here are, using an orbifold, make these things nicer behaved, just like sum over 1 over n is nicer behaved if you put a minus 1 to the n. Alternating series is convergent. It's conditionally convergent, but convergent. So this could help a little bit, meaning put an orbifold, a twisted modular graph function. This, is, as far as I know, has not been studied in great detail. The other alternative would be to put a mass. So overflow, we could put our W parameter non-zero. Or if we put a mass, then this might also take care of some of your infrared divergences. I will do this in the talk on Friday. What happens if you put a mass? I'm not saying all problems you can think of are cured, but I think try something different. This is not the end state. It's to say we're going to need both dimensional organization and cutoff. I think if you do it differently, you might be able to do it with just one of them, for example. So what you're trying to integrate over is some automorphic form like E2 that we just talked about. The goal here is to think of the automorphic form as a Poincaré series. For example, gamma divided by this Borel that we talked about. And Borel is the one that shifts tau goes to tau plus one. And then we have C the function. So this is for the Eisenstein series in particular. We had this to the power S. Then the key point here is that you can now 
flip this sum of the modular group to here. So basically now you get, if this was cut off, you basically use the sum to unfold this to an integral of the strip. Then you just have imaginary part of tau to the S. You unfold the integral to just be on the strip possibly with this cutoff. So this is the strip SL. And we integrate of this strip, you're going from minus one half to plus one half. So you project out Fourier modes, all the non-zero Fourier modes integrate to zero over this interval. So the only contribution is from what mathematicians call the constant term, which is highly misleading since it depends on tau two. So it's not constant in this direction, but it's constant in this direction. The holomorphic case, it is literally constant. The holomorphic Eisenstein series just has a constant here, like two times zeta two s or something. But here it depends on tau two. And this is the only contribution you get once you project out by integrating over tau one. So I think that partially answers your question because this is symmetry. We choose to work with tau. And as I argue in my course notes, this is basically a standardization we have agreed upon because tau is actually originally defined as some ratio over lattice parameters. But once we agreed to work with this ratio, then we have this symmetry that we have to implement. And this symmetry means that you can expand in Fourier modes. That will always project out these modes. It's really the T symmetry of the modular group that always gives this simplification if you want. And that precisely corresponds to having this Borel subgroup, which here is just this, but in general automorphic forms, this would be some more complicated abelian subgroup of a non-abelian big group like SL3 or SP something.